Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Anne Brennan. I'm head of the Art Theory Workshop at the School of Art. Welcome to this extraordinary crowd of people. Um, we have just recently refurbished this lecture theatre and we're very uh, pleased and proud to be showing it off. But I have to say, this is the biggest crowd that we've ever had in this lecture theatre. <laughs> um, or at least for many, many years. And it's very gratifying that this, uh, the program in which Mr Stanhope is about to speak uh, is, has received such um, a fantastic reception from the Canberra public. So before I introduce uh, Professor Mandy Thomas, who will then introduce Mr Stanhope, I'd like to acknowledge the first Australians on whose land we meet today uh, and whose cultures, which are among the oldest continuing cultures in human history, we celebrate. Um, I am welcoming the Chief Minister and Minister for the Arts for the ACT, uh, Mr John Stanhope, to the School of Art to speak in our Art Forum program. Now the School of Art receives significant funding from the ACT government for our outreach program and Art Forum, our Art Forum public lecture program is a very significant part of our art outreach program. Now Mr Stanhope's been invited today to participate in a satellite program within Art Forum called The Big Talk in which we address the role of art and public space. The Big Talk will run uh, in a series of programs over the next 12 months, culminating in a conference on public art and placemaking in the middle of next year. Now, if any of you are interested uh, in the Art Forum program, we do have uh, uh, flyers and we are compiling a mailing list in which we will email you every week and advise you of what we're doing in the Art Forum program. Um, so please feel free to sign up um, over here uh, and take a, um, a flyer from the plinth uh, just behind this crowd of students over here on the left. Um, now, public art is a kind of given uh, in most cities these days and it's one of those uh, things that most people, if you asked them, would uh, tell you that they love the idea of public art. And yet we have seen here in Canberra too extraordinary examples of the way in which public art has been embroiled in political controversy in the last eight years or so. You only have to think about Jennifer Turpin's ill-fated uh, proposal for that big red fan in the middle of the parliamentary triangle to see how quickly public art can get under the collars of politicians. Uh, and of course Richard Goodwin's sculpture at the Gungahl and Drive interchange attracted its fair share of political point scoring in 2008. So we're hoping that the big talk will actually raise some issues around public art and its uses. Is public art in fact uh, something that we could do without in Canberra, an already extremely um, uh, designed city? Or is it in fact um, crucial to the construction of Canberra's identity in the next century? These are the issues we want to address in the big talk and we're leading off with uh, Mr Stanhope today who's in an ideal position uh, to uh, speak about these things from a political uh, and policy making point of view. To introduce Mr Stanhope I'd like to welcome Professor Mandy Thomas, the Pro Vice-Chancellor of Research and Graduate Studies at ANU and a very good friend of the School of Art. So welcome Professor Thomas. So the Art Forum program at the ANU School of Art has been an integral element of the school's teaching and outreach program since 1983. The Big Talk Public Art Lecture Series will be followed by an international symposium addressing public art and the planned capital city of Canberra to be held in 2011. I'm delighted to be able to introduce um, John Stanhope, Stanhope, Chief Minister and Minister for Arts and Heritage, who's kindly agreed to participate in the big talk and will discuss arguing for art, the politics of the ACT government's percent for art scheme. John Stanhope has been a strong and vocal advocate for the importance of public art in the ACT. 
Mr Stanhope will discuss the importance of public art in our streetscapes and city places, its contribution to the cultural life of our community and the challenges of making a record investment in public art in the Territory. So welcome Chief Minister John Stanhope. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for the invitation to be here today. Uh, Professor Mandy Thomas, Pro Vice-Chancellor, Research and Graduate Studies. Ms Anne Brennan, Head of the Art Theory Workshop at the ANU School of Art. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. And I do thank you. And uh, I do thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here today and to talk to you. In 1959, the sculptor Tom Bass was commissioned by the newly created National Capital Development Commission and the Canberra Chamber of Commerce to create a piece of public art for the city of Canberra. It wasn't to be a work that was intended to be anchored in the plaza of a great public building or a gateway work situated on a grand boulevard. It wasn't designed for the flagged stones outside the nation's parliament or for the sculpture garden of a national gallery. It was to be a work for this city and for the people who call it home. It was to be located beyond the parliamentary triangle. It was destined for the domestic heart of the young capital, away from the monuments of culture and learning. In its brief to the artist, the NCDC urged Bass to reflect what it called the restless, virile, energetic movement of free enterprise that characterised the new capital. It wanted a work it said to mark the non-political centre of the city. Bass believed from the start that the proposed name for the work, The Spirit of Canberra, sounded more like the name of a train than the title of a work of art. He changed the name and instead gave us ethos, our earliest and still one of our most loved pieces of civic public art. The word ethos ref refers to the distinctive spirit of a people. Fifty years after she was installed in Civic Square, holding aloft a bursting sun, our ethos still speaks to us and still speaks about us, the two most important functions of great public art. I had the pleasure of meeting Tom Bass when he visited ethos, which he always believed to be the most significant of his civic works for a final time in 2007. By coincidence, just a few months before Bass's visit, I had announced a new ACT government policy for the purchase and maintenance of public art. It was a policy I hoped would embed expenditure on the arts once and for all into the budget cycle. It was a policy that would normalise spending on public art so that commissioning and purchasing art for our public realm would become as ordinary a part of the business of government as cutting the grass or filling potholes, though perhaps I thought a little more fun. The Percent for Art Scheme would see the devotion of 1% of every year's public capital works budget dedicated to public art. No longer, I fancied, would expenditure on the arts be regarded as an opportunity cost, but as an opportunity seized. Arguing for art would become a thing of the past. Yet, less than two years after the announcement of the Percent for Art Scheme, I found myself fighting an election campaign in which public art and the Percent for Art Scheme featured uh, and this was confirmed by Labor Party polling, as one of the identified risks to my government's prospects of re-election. The campaign against funding of public art, ostensibly run by the Liberal Party, but I have to say ably assisted by this city's only daily newspaper, the Canberra Times, was a relentless one. The visual focus of the critics' campaign was narrowly kept on a small handful of controversial works. The rhizome on the GDE, the Al Grasby statue in the foyer of the Theo Notaris Multicultural Centre, and the one that came in for some of the most vicious criticism, Phil Price's delightful wind sculpture, Denonis Maximus on Adelaide Avenue. Someone with an overly active imagination actually went to the trouble of concocting an urban myth concerning Phil's work. The rumour spread that in fact it wasn't a kinetic sculpture moved by the wind at all, but was secretly guzzling energy from the electricity grid. <laughs> As proof of this fraud upon the city, the urban myth insisted that the sculpture's blades were mysteriously locked in an upright position each night. This particular theory gained such traction in the community that I was indeed questioned about it 
by my Labor colleagues in caucus. <laughs> the subtext, the subliminal message of the entire campaign was brutally simple. The message was this, that the arts, and not just public art, are a luxury, not the core business of government. That expenditure on the arts is fine and dandy, but only after every single person on the elective surgery waiting list has been seen to. That the arts are all very well, but you can't fill a pothole with impasto, though perhaps you could. <laughs> Overlaid on the anti-art rhetoric of the campaign was the personal attack on me. I was only interested in sculptures, the critics said, because I wanted to erect monuments to my own ego. It is apparently all about me. If Canber Canberrans didn't watch out, I'd be commissioning life-size bronzes of myself for Garima Place, they insisted. Which I think does show how little my political opponents truly understand me. Such a commission would not be life-size, it would be <laughs> twice life-size. <laughs> it would be seated on a horse <laughs> and it would be installed in the Arboretum. <laughs> the cumulative effect of weeks and months of this sustained campaign against the Percent for Arts scheme, with scarcely a friendly third party appearing to defend the scheme, took its toll. I just digress uh, to explain that my government is, I think, perhaps one of the few, if not the only, uh, government in Australia that hasn't succumbed uh, to that modern affliction of recourse constantly to polling and to focus groups. In fact, we don't do it at all, except in the lead up to elections when we do do some significant polling for two or three months. And uh, we don't normally talk about our internal polling for reasons that I've never been clear about, we political parties. But it was revealed in uh, some regular polling we did in the three months in the lead up to the last election uh, and through focus group, work, group works where we seek to explore the minds of the so-called swinging voter to understand what it is that uh, causes them to change their vote, so far as we're concerned, from us to the Liberal Party. Uh, and it was, uh, uh, it is a fact uh, that in all of our polling uh, in the two to three months prior to the last ACT election, when asked to give reasons for why uh, those polled were sitting, considering or contemplating changing their vote from the Labor Party to the Liberal Party, my support for public art appeared in every single poll in the top five reasons. The result was that in the months after the election, in the hours of deep personal reflection that ensued, I announced the abolition of the scheme. I sometimes ponder the lack of public support at the time it was needed. Even the arts community itself was essentially silent, with a handful of notable exceptions. Some who claim a connection with the cultural community have suggested to me that the notorious jealousies of the art world mean that artists working in one medium don't readily support government largesse directed at those working in another. And I have had some letters to that effect. Performers Performance artists don't approve of money going to public art. Musicians don't applaud an investment in printmaking. Painters resent writers. Established artists think emerging artists get too much help. And everyone, of course, hates the poets. <laughs> I, suspect, I suspect it's probably a little more basic than that. I've been in politics long enough to understand and accept the profound and uncomfortable silence that emanates from a sector prior to an election when it isn't at all sure that, it, that it's, its minister is still going to be its minister in a few weeks. Two years on from the ACT election, my instinct is that much of the heat has gone out of the public art debate. The Canberra Times seems to have tired of its campaign. Not many of its letter writers have been able to sustain their indignation. The other day, indeed, a well-known public figure commented to me that if I announced today that I was selling Denornis Maximus back to the New Zealanders, I'd probably have a riot on my hands. Maybe so. We all know of, of examples of artworks that were born in controversy and ended up much loved. Jackson Pollock's Blue Poles is an obvious domestic example. I remember it well, a national disgrace when it was purchased by the National Gallery for $1.4 million in 1973. The work of a barefoot drunk is now valued, I'm told, at around $180 million and draws visitors 
from around the world to our city. On a rather larger scale, the Eiffel Tower was intended as a temporary gateway arch to the World Fair of 1889, an expo, incidentally, that featured among its more fantastic sideshow attractions, sharp shooting demonstrations by Buffalo Bill and Annie Oakley. The burghers of Paris initially hated the iron monstrosity of the Eiffel Tower. Paris's versions of our Canberra Times were filled with angry letters from the arts community. I'm sure the paper probably editorialised too. The city, or at least that aspect of the city that dominates the pages of the newspaper, was incensed. Today, the Eiffel Tower is the most recognisable monument in continental Europe and a worldwide symbol of the romance of Paris, loved as fervently by the French as by the world community of Francophile. But public reactions to this particular piece of art or that particular piece of art are, in a sense, distractions from the deeper issue of whether government support for the arts, including for public art, is a legitimate and valid use of public money. And if we believe it is, the next question is how we should prosecute the case. How do we rationally argue for the arts, not just in the heat of an election campaign, but at any time? In lean years, as well as in bounteous budget cycles, is there one cogent argument that will serve for all seasons and all times? Over the decades, those of us who believe intuitively in the social and spiritual value of a rich and accessible cultural life have repeatedly sought to construct an economic case for the arts. We've sensed, I suppose, that this is the best way to persuade our treasuries that the arts are as worthy of funding as our schools and hospitals and municipal services, or dare I say it, sport. <coughs> it's always a problematic case to make, however we cut the numbers. There's an inherent difficulty in mounting a straightforward economic case for a sector that, however many it employs and whatever its contribution to GDP, has always depended for its very survival on the money of others, whether that other be a Medici, a Pope Julius, an Australia Council or Arts ACT. Not only have our treasuries remained sceptical, I fear the community has too, to some degree. More recently, again in an attempt to quantify what cultural practice really means to society, we've contrived to assign a more instrumental value to the arts. We've argued that exposure to the arts and culture confers social or other benefits. We've pointed out that art and culture can be used to treat mental illness and juvenile delinquency, to educate people about environmental degradation and climate change, to help unlock the memories of dementia patients, to help victims of trauma express their feelings. And we've seen more and more of the private philanthropic support for the arts, as well as a portion of government support directed at such instrumental social policy outcomes. Yet even as we've made the case, we've again struggled to quantify things or to prove that art is better than an anti-Alzheimer's drug or a decent ad campaign on climate change. And there's been an understandable backlash from the arts themselves, which resent forever being tricked up as social workers rather than being accorded the dignity of their craft. Even when we've tried to maintain a partial argument for an intrinsic as opposed to an instrumental value for the arts, we've drifted into an, expect, into an expectation that what we get for our investment ought to be measurable. It ought to be visible and reportable in the form, say, of audience development. It's not always been this way. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, under the Commonwealth Public Art Program and its predecessor, the Direct Acquisitions Grant, the focus seemed genuinely, genuinely to be more on supporting the professional practice of what we might call serious artists with the incidental benefit that the broader community would be brought into random but presumably beneficial contact with elevating works of high culture. The NCDC's commissions for the National Capital were a case in point. The NCDC commissioned artworks for the grand public buildings emerging from the ground and for the public spaces between them. Existing works were also acquired for particular sites. For its commissions, the NCDC ran either competitions or commissioned artists directly. One of the overt aims was to create opportunities to display the work of quality Australian artists. Between 1960 and 1980, 105 works by Australian artists were installed in the capital. 65 of these were commissions. 11 other works from international artists found a home in the capital. Examples from the period include Robert Cook's Sublime Thespis, commissioned for the Canberra Theatre in 1965, Bert Flugelman's untitled fountain sculpture for the Bruce Hall forecourt, 
installed in 1967, and Margold Hinder's sculptured form installed in 1972 in the Waden Town Square. Such major commissions helped mid-career and emerging artists of excellence make a living and contributed to the cultural development of the nation. And there was the deliberate intent of the and that was the deliberate intent of the investment. The commissioning of major artworks in the new capital sent a message that this was a nation that valued the visual arts. What better way to prove it than by having it out for the world to see in a museum without walls? Since then, of course, public art has come down off its high horse. Indeed, I think the last horse commissioned in Canberra probably stands outside Old Parliament House. Such has been the fate of figurative sculpture. In recent decades, I like sculptures of horses. In recent decades, <laughs> public art has welcomed into its orbit works that are ephemeral, installations composed entirely of light or sound, performance art pieces and site-specific temporary works. Events such as sculpture by the sea can combine the lot in a smorgasbord stretching from Bondi to Bronte. A number of the works purchased through the ACT's Percent for Arts scheme began their lives in a stiff sea breeze on a Sydney headland. The first years of self-government were fairly, fairly lean ones for the Territory when it came to public art purchases beyond the parliamentary triangle. Suddenly we were on our own and our budgets in those first years were modest. In the years leading up to self-government, the NCDC had cast an eye over its own collection and had decided which works it wanted to keep and which would be handed to the new Territory Government to have hold and significantly to maintain. Works that stayed with the Commonwealth included John Dowie's father and son in Garima Place. Works transferred to the Territory included Kerry Simpson's Illumi Cube, which I think speaks for itself, really. It wasn't until the mid-1990s under the Carnell Government that a meaningful public art program grew out of the Floriard Sculpture Project. The ACT Government began commissioning works, often for shopping centre refurbishments at a rate of one or two a year, with commission values of around the $100,000 mark. Works commissioned during this period include Stepping Out at the Hughes Shops by Giovanni Ianelli and Gerard Murphy. By the end of the decade, we had acquired The Master's Voice, an auditory work in City Walk by Sonia Lieber and David Chesworth, Ainsley's Sheep by Les Cosatz, and The Cushion by Matthew Harding. A series of temporary public art exhibitions followed in the first half of the new decade under my government. In 2006, as Arts Minister, I embarked on a sculpture acquisition project with $1 million over two years. Works funded under the scheme included Choice of Passage by local artist Phil Spillman, The Parcel by Alexander Seaton, and the much maligned Leonornis Maximus. These works were not commissioned, they were bought off the shelf, a process that meant they could be installed in about six months from the time of purchase. The commissioning process takes around two years. Suddenly, we were seeing a critical mass of new works appearing around town. The work of 15 new artists was added to the ACT Government's collection almost overnight. Inspired, I announced the Percent for Art scheme. It shouldn't have been an issue on which an election needed to be fought and almost lost. Such schemes have existed in the home of economic rationalism the United States since the 1970s and the United Kingdom, Canada and other Australian jurisdictions since the 80s. Queensland, Western Australia and Tasmania all currently have one. The Western Australian Government allocates up to 1% of the estimated total construction cost of each capital works project valued at $2 million or more to a commissioned artwork. The Queensland scheme requires that 2% of the gross project cost of Queensland Government capital works in excess of $250,000 be allocated for public art and design. In Tasmania, 2% of the total value of new state government buildings or renovations is directed to public art to an upper limit of $80,000. And of course, governments are not alone in building collections of public art. The ANU has an active campaign of commissioning works for the campus and for its international sculpture park. The result over time has been the establishment of a significant collection of more than 50 works by Australian and international artists. And corporation by corporation, our private sector is beginning to do more. The Malonglo Group is making a truly stunning investment in public art at its new Acton development. Leighton Properties purchased and gifted untitled 2008 by French artist Jean-Pierre Reeves to the people of Canberra and installed it on London Circuit. Consolidated Builders Limited has loaned to the Territory the specially commissioned work Resilience by Anti Dabro. This truly monumental work is located in City Walk. And Actu AGL, I'm told, 
is preparing to surprise us with a work shortly to be unveiled in its new headquarters on Maud Street. So in this generally pos positive atmosphere, what went wrong with the government's program? One thing was that the birth of the scheme coincided roughly with the delivery of a couple of works that generated significant negative public commentary, the old Grasby statue and the Rhizome. Ironically, the commitment to a percent for arts scheme and the simultaneous establishment of an expert panel of independent Canberrans to advise me on selection and placement of future works was my attempt to respond proactively to the seemingly random appearance on the scene of works like the Grasby statue and the Gungahlin Drive extension artworks. The Grasby statue, of course, carried its own political freight and the GDE works, whatever their inherent quality, were associated with a major road that had been far too many years in the delivery, thanks in major part to a legal action by a section of the community. I had thought that by having an independent panel of respected and knowledgeable Canberrans chaired by Dr Paul Hetherington advising me on which works to commission or buy, there would be someone, indeed I had hoped a few someones, to share my pain as well, hopefully the glory, as new works started popping up around the city. But despite the new works being commissioned, the letter writers and the journalists went back again and again and again to the Grasby statue and to the GDE artwork and to poor old De Mornis Maximus. Another factor working against us could have been that the introduction of the scheme coincided with a massive burst of energy by the government in relation to capital works. The amount the government now spends in a single year on capital works is equivalent to the amount the previous government spent during its entire period in office. Perhaps the change from a very modest investment to a genuinely significant one was too hard for people to take. It is in fact okay to spend public money on the arts as long as you don't spend too much. It was the first time that funding running into the millions had ever been allocated to public art by a territory government. The 2007-08 budget allocation under the Percent for Arts scheme was $991,000. This funded commissions including the recently launched entry artwork at the Bill Connan Arts Centre and a round of acquisitions that included Gravity Circle by Haruki Uchida next to the ACT Magistrates Court and the lovable On the Staircase by Danish artist Keld Mosholm in Petri Plaza. The 2008-09 budget allocation of $2.3 million funded six commissioned works, including the monumental Icarus series by Jan Brown and Wide Brown Land by Futago and Marcus Tatton, located at the Arboretum. The 2009-10 budget allocation for public art totaled $4.58 million, and work has commenced on 18 new commissions to be funded from this allocation. The opportunities for local artists have been significant. In the, past, in the past five years, we have commissioned work from David Jens, Phil Nazette, Jennifer Jones, Tim Spellman, Tess Horowitz, Tony Steele, Martin Jolly, Jim Williams, Susie Bleach, Andy Townsend, Jan Brown and Peter Latona. Exist existing works have been acquired from Klaus Moget, Mel Douglas, Tom Rowney, Richard Whiteley, Kirsty Ray, Phil Spellman and Diane Fogwell. The total value of works acquired or commissioned from local artists by the Territory in the past five years comes to $1.4 million. Future commissions by local artists include works by David Jens and Michael Legrand. The value of works to be installed in 2011 by local artists comes to $800,000. The work of at least 21 local artists has been added to the Territory's public art collection in the past five years. Many of those represented in our collection incidentally are connected in one way or another with the ANU School of Arts Sculpture Workshop, either as alumni or teaching staff, and they include Jan Brown, Michael Legrand, David Jens, Neil Roberts, Phil Spellman and Tim Spellman. The contribution of the workshop to training artists and to artwork fabrication, including through its foundry operations, is simply immense and needs to be recognised here today. But even the presence of such excellence at the heart of the city could not diffuse the politics of the Percent for Arts scheme. As I say, perhaps it was too much too quickly. Perhaps I was too keen and perhaps even naive, heaven forbid. Perhaps there never really was an opportunity in such a heightened atmosphere to make a general intellectual case for funding public art. And in fact, even if there had been an opening, what case could be made? The economic case has not proved robust enough to get past a Treasury official with a calculator and an understanding of opportunity cost. The instrumental argument alienates the artists. 
can we return to the NCDC days, perhaps, when excellence was a good enough excuse for expenditure. But there is no going back. Excellence is a concept, not a measurable quantity. We need a new argument, but if it needs, but it, we need a new argument, but it needs to be philosophically simpler rather than more complicated. We need an argument that is explicit about what we get from art, about the richness it adds to our everyday existence, about the capacity it has to help us express our shared identity and thereby strengthen that identity, about the ability it has to allow us to tackle deeply sensitive and confronting issues without taking to arms or the, to the courts to do it, about how it can be both a spiritual salve and an intellectual challenge but we need to be able to express these values as positive things without attaching a dollar value or defensively arguing that spending as art saves us money elsewhere. In a recent article in the Art newspaper, Robert Hewison called for the development of a more sophisticated form of cultural economics so that government support of the arts can be appropriately defended. There is a sound economic argument, he wrote, that when the market fails to provide goods that are demonstrably useful, health and education, for example, then it becomes necessary and proper for the state to intervene. The economics of the arts, he argues, are prone to such market failure because they cannot easily make the advances in productivity that we prize in other industry sectors. A symphony played on a synthesizer is not an efficiency gain, he argues. It seems a hopeless case, and yet perhaps not. As Hewison also points out, the inaugural chairman of the post-war Arts Council in, Brisbane, in, in Britain established at a time when the museums were barely restocking their cabinets and reopening their doors, and when the concert, concert halls were still taking down the blackout, was none other than the economist John Maynard Keynes. He was a believer in stimulating the economy in times of recession, but he didn't argue for funding for the arts on economic grounds or because it could combat juvenile delinquency or cure Alzheimer's, he argued post-war, post-World War II for government funding for the arts because he believed that one of the things his nation was supposed to have been fighting for was civilisation. Thank you.